So with all that said, then what do you do about the religious people? Because if I was to take, I, I don't wanna, New Atheists I think get attacked a lot, often yeah. unfairly I think, because people just pick, they, they think that they're so mean and they're right. trying to destroy religion and they hate religious people. I very rarely have ever seen that. I think they attack the ideas of religion, mm -hmm. which as you know I would say should be attacked just sure. like any other idea there is. But going under this, uh, this objectivist ideology, what do you do with the religious people? Well, How do they fit into a society? Because I don't think you're trying to exterminate them or even fully their, uh, <laughs> certainly not the people, but, but even the ideas of religion, I don't sense that you, you'd prefer, I suppose, that they start yeah, crumbling, yeah. but not. No, I want them to crumble. There's, there's, yeah. there's no question. Yeah. I, I want them to crumble. I, I don't, See, I was trying to be nice. I was trying I know, to give you a I know, nice little. I know, but I, no, I, I want them gone. And, but there's only one way to do that. And that's education, education, education. It's to speak. It's the, it's the reason with people. And, and I think my whole project, everything I believe in, is to some extent dependent on uh, the demise of religion. Uh, I, you know, I don't think without the Enlightenment and the, the beginning of the demise of religion in the 18th century, you would have had a United States of America. I think the United States of America is a secular achievement. I mean, counter to all the religious right who claim it's the, it's the culmination of a Judeo-Christian. There's nothing Judeo-Christian about the United Jesus States of America. Jesus rode to Texas on a dinosaur. Yeah, and, and in the Old Testament, their individual rights and <laughs> the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Is, I mean, it's not there, right? It, it, this, is the, this is the achievement of human reason, of secularization, of the idea of relegating religion to your private life, which, is a, which politically is enough, right? So we can have a free society if we say religion is relegated and you can't bring it into the public square. But that never happens, right? The evangelicals are not just gonna sit there and say, we're never gonna go into politics as, as we see today and as we've seen for the last 40, 50 years. They're very involved, and they were in the 19th century, very involved in the political life. So, and they bring religion into the public uh, square. At the, and I also, the other thing is, I'm not in this for politics, right? Politics is, is, a, is, is the outcome, it, it's great. If, if, if we get to live in a really free society, that would be so cool. <laughs> but to me, much more important is what we started out the conversation with, is the impact I can have and these ideas can have on an individual human being in making that individual's life better. So to me, the objectivist ethics, the objectivist moral code is much more important to me than, than the, all the politics and capitalism and all this, uh, this stuff. It's, it, the capitalism is just an outcome of that. So I partially, I want to see demise of religion because I want to free those religious people from what I think are barriers to their own success and their own happiness. Um, and partially because I think that the truly free society cannot exist as long as a significant number of people take their religion seriously. I think religion is anti-freedom at, at its core, and the more seriously they take their religion, the less free we will be. So, so I, I, I want to get rid of religion, but I realize that that's going to take forever. It's going to take a long, long time, decades, centuries maybe. In the meantime, it, convince as many people as I can, it, bring in these ideas. So I have people writing to me and they sign it, Christian objectivist. And then I have <laughs> Jewish objectivist, Hindu objectivist, and everybody thinks their religion and objectivism are the same, right? Yeah. You can, fine. So my view is I'd rather have you be an, a, a Christian objectivist than a Christian Christian, right? I'd rather have you adopt certain ideas from objectivism into your Christian framework than not adopt any of the ideas. So to the extent that I can, they can impact people's lives, even if they don't embrace everything that I say, right? And, and it's a little spooky if we sit here and talk and somebody says, yeah, I agree. I've never heard of you wrong, but I agree with everything you wrong just said. <laughs> right, I right, go, right. go, go read a little bit, go study, yeah. right? Because all I'm trying to do here and, and in my public talks is, is get people thinking. Yeah. And then if they read and then one day they come to the conclusion I was right, cool. But I, 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 you know, if people are convinced by one lecture, or one talk, then it's scary to me a little bit. Because isn't it I, funny I though that. that association thing is kind of funny? Because the phrase, "Well, I don't agree with everything he says," I feel like people say that all the time yes. now, implying that if you even say something nice or you like a tweet of someone, <laughs> yeah, you true. obviously endorse everything <laughs> that they've ever said yes. ever. Yes. So I, so I appreciate that you're yeah. saying that, but I, but I know you're not just saying it because I've been to several of these events that you guys put on yep. and, and colleges, as I said, we're gonna do a whole bunch yep. uh, come this fall. Um, but the, the wide variety of people in diversity of thought, there was plenty of diversity in all the other stuff too, uh, but in the diversity of thought, so it wasn't as if, oh, well, those objectivists, they only accept, there were, there no, were people the, there who said they were believers. When, oh yeah, when most we did of the people I talk to, most of the people, I'd say 90% yeah. of the people that I actually speak in front of, yeah. either don't know anything about what I'm gonna say, 
all violently disagree, hopefully not violently, but they disagree intellectually, fundamentally with what I say. And I, I just I, I have to say, I enjoy speaking to hostile audiences much more than I enjoy speaking to objective audiences. <laughs> Object, you know, they can agree with what I say. I can push the envelope a little bit here, a little bit there. I can stimulate them a little bit. But to see an audience that comes in hostile and, and at the end of the day is a little respectful of the ideas because I've said something and I've said it in a way that resonates with them and they go, all right, so maybe I need to think about this again. That to me is so much more fun and so much more interesting and so much more world changing at the end than just talking to the converted, if you will, and, and, and talking to people. So I, I, love, I love being challenged by young people. I love going to universities and having people really go after me. Yeah, and, and there's videos online. There's videos online, you can find yeah. them and, and you can tell that I'm enjoying it because I really get into it. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it makes it fun for me, right? I, I, I want to be challenged. I, I, want, I, I keep telling audiences, I want you to come up with a question I've never heard before. Yeah. I, want, I want to be pushed because it's, it's not fun stagnating, even if you think you know, even if you think what you're saying is true, you don't want to stagnate on that. You want to keep pushing the envelope. Yeah, and even the, this uh, just idea out there that somehow objectivists are, are, are all serious or whatever. I mean, we did this yeah. event. There's video of it, 500 people. Not only did I have everyone cheering and screaming and standing up and going crazy, they were, we did this whole funny thing about the seven dirty yes. words, George yes. Carlin. Yes. I don't know that everyone yes. was thrilled with me, <laughs> but I had everyone screaming all the, all the words and all that. And, but it goes more to the point that I think people are just starved for some reality these days. Just having fun, yelling out some curses oh, and it being okay. Like yeah. we've sort of forgotten how to just be okay with but there is this, some craziness. There's this perception that if you're an advocate for reason, if you're rational and believe in science, <laughs> they show how <laughs> stuck up yeah. and you don't believe, you know, I, I'm, I love emotions, right? I'm a passionate guy, but I, I love sitting down and just l listening to music and just feeling, you know, you live you experience the life through your emotions, and and you gotta value your emotions. You gotta cultivate your emotions. You gotta really, you gotta really experience your emotions. Emotions are not just uh, uh, just not tools of cognition. You don't discover facts. You don't discover truth emotionally. That's what you use reason for. But it doesn't mean you demean your emotions. You put down your emotions. It means you know their place in your life. You, Emotions don't have to do with truth, maybe truth about me, mm -hmm. but not truth about the world out there. Reason to discover truth. You just need to know what part of yourself uh, is responsible for what. So uh, objectivists who understand the philosophy, and many of them don't, many of them, I mean, there are a lot of jokes out there. There are a lot of people who use the philosophy uh, to be jokes, but uh, objectivists who are, f are well integrated, uh, emotional people, you know, because they, they, they understand the, the important role emotions play in human life. So you have been bouncing all over the world. Yes. I'm honored that you stopped in LA <laughs> during this world tour. Anytime. Just quickly, Anytime. just name some of the places that you've been just in the last few months. I mean, you have really been all over the place. Well, just in the last few months, I, I, I did a tour of Asia. I, did, I went around the world for yeah, the you first literally, time. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, so I went from California, I went to uh, Tokyo, Kyoto, Seoul, South Korea, to play uh, Wangju in Beijing in China. Uh, Ulan Batar in Mongolia, Hong Kong, Tel Aviv, London, Clemson University, which I know you're yeah. gonna go to in the, in the fall, yeah. and then back to California. And um, spoke at every one of those places, gave talks to all, and there are people in all of those places passionate. I've also been, as we've talked about, to many places in Eastern Europe. I'm heading back to Tbilisi, which in Georgia. I'm going yeah. to Baku in Azerbaijan. Uh, but I've been, to, I've been many times now and I'm going back to Kiev and to Warsaw and to Krakow and to Sofia, Bulgaria. And I, I was in Albania and in Montenegro and Macedonia, <laughs> you know, which most people, certainly Americans don't even know where, where they are on the map. Yeah. But um, half my audience just thinks you're making up words right now. Yeah, I, <laughs> I hope not. We have, no, we got a pretty audience bright is group more intelligent. Here. Your audience is a, is but wait, a I'm, I, I want to stop there because yeah. I'm glad you mentioned Eastern yeah. Europe because yeah. that's where I wanted to go with this because you mentioned to me a couple weeks ago yeah. that you're finding that in Eastern Europe right now, they're incredibly receptive to these ideas yeah. because they've had so many bad ideas yes. for so long. Yes. They no longer can tolerate bad ideas, or, or that they're starving they're for They're starving ideas. for something. They, yeah. they know what they have is wrong, right? So, they, so within memory, within a couple of generations, maybe three, right? They've had fascism, they've lived under the Nazis, they've had communism, uh, brutal communism, right? I mean, they, 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 their parents were oppressed by communism. 
And now they just have corruption. <laughs> they have democracy, they vote, mm -hmm. but the sense generally in Eastern Europe is the, the government is corrupt, they, they, everything is, is cronyism, people, and, and they, they look at the West and they, they, they see America, they see Germany, they see England, they, they know it's possible in terms of wealth, they know it's possible in terms of freedom, and, and they, they want that. And, and they're looking for what it is that leads to that. And they know that the alternative, and, and they look at the European Union, and they're suspicious of that too. Centralized power, autocratic, bureaucratic, dictating from the top down. Mm -hmm. So they are, I, my sense in those places, and I, I'd add Brazil and some of the Latin American countries to this as well, they've experienced so much horror over the last 100 years that young people, you know, college age people, high school, early 20s, are looking for something different. And they're open to new ideas. They're willing to be challenged. You can't, they're not gonna buy into the Marxist garbage. They're not gonna buy into silencing free speech. Yeah? Because it's been there, done that, right? So when you come to them and talk about freedom, when you come talk to them about real personal responsibility, taking your life seriously, pursuit of happiness, uh, they are open in ways that a rich, complacent, college kid in the United States isn't, right? Marxism sounds kind of cool. <laughs> I've never experienced it. I don't know any histories. I don't know what it's done in the world. Right. And I don't even understand the role of ideas and how ideas actually impact actions. So what the hell? And, and I'm, I'm, I'm really worried about the next iPhone and, and, and whether it's gonna have the features I really want. But I hate capitalism. Right. You know, capitalism's evil, but, but the iPhone, oh my God, I, I, I need that. And Twitter they, and they Facebook. Also, and they, you know, they also get over the fact that it's made in China with people being paid very little. Yeah, to, yeah they attack know. me at my talks <laughs> as they're reading the question <laughs> off their iPhone, right? They attack me for, for, for praising Apple and then they, they go after the Chinese workers, but they're using the iPhone. They have no... They have no respect for the, even the ideas that they, they hold, because if they were truly held those ideas, they'd give up the iPhone, they'd give up the Samsung, because the same thing with Samsung. They, they wouldn't use modern technology because they, their ideas are not consistent with modern technology. But they, they're complacent, life is too good, right? Life is too comfortable. And, and it, I'd add, so it's complacency on the one hand. The other thing you notice is that our educational system in the United States, it's hard to express how bad it really is. It, it, it is anti-thinking, it is anti-really uh, uh, using one's mind, it is, it, and it's, it's, it's all about emotion. It's all about cultivating emotion, not as a way of living, but as, as experienced life, but as a, a tool of cognition, as knowing real. It, what you feel is true. Mm -hmm. I mean, you see that on the free speech debate. That is a big part of the free speech debate. Feelings are truths. And the world is, is no objective reality. It's whatever I want it to be, whatever I feel it to be. That's the postmodernism. That's the culmination of it. Um, so, it, it, but that's in our educational system. That's deeply rooted in education. When you sit down six-year-olds and ask them what they think about, or what they feel about Trump, what does a six-year-old know about politics? I mean, six-year-olds should not be exposed to politics. Apparently, a lot of the pundits on Twitter, their children know these incredible essays and have <laughs> such incredible insight into Trump. My kid just said, and then yes. they, they lay out something that obviously the kid didn't But say. in a class, we ask these kids for opinions about topics that they know nothing <laughs> about, right? You have to have life experience. You have to have knowledge. You, and we, if you don't have an educational system, so hooking back to, to Eastern Europe, the educational systems in Europe not just in Eastern Europe, but even in the UK and so in, in Asia, are just better than ours. So the kids know more. They know how history. Did they get, how did they get education systems right if they got so much political? Oh, no, wrong? I didn't say they got it right. Or not right, They're but better. Okay, better, better. So what I would say is the educational system in the world was at a certain level going into the 20th century. And the United States adopted progressive education and went like that, went down. Right? And the rest of the world kind of putzed around in mediocrity, which is where I think they are today. Mm -hmm. So their educational system is mediocre. They're not good, so, fair but, enough. But, but they're mediocre. Ours is a catastrophe because we took James Dewey seriously. So we embraced, because <laughs> he was the first uh, American philosopher. Right? Everything else came from Europe. Finally, we found an American who, who spoke philosophy. We just embraced him and made him one of any, any, and his philosophy was a pragmatic philosophy, which appealed, I guess, to some extent to Americans who were action-oriented rather than intellectual-oriented. So we embraced this idea of progressive education, which was focused on socializing kids, not on teaching them and not on knowledge. So I think the British system and the European system is bad because it's too regimented. And it, and it, and it, 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 but, it, but what it's good at is conveying knowledge. The American system 
doesn't convey knowledge, it lets kids, but it, if you're exceptional, you do very well in that system because you mm -hmm. learn yourself and then you're allowed to innovate. So that's why you get, I think, the, the Steve Jobses, the, the, the real innovators, the Silicon Valley types, because it's not regimented. And one of the reasons that, so what you need is a well calibrated, I wouldn't say middle ground, but, but what you need is a system that both conveys knowledge and allows individuals, the children, to, to innovate, to think freely, to, to, to experiment with ideas. So you mentioned that your passion really is not the political side of this, but the philosophical side does, ultimately, it feeds into everything yes. that becomes political. So what would the right amount of government be, in your estimation? Because I, I hear this all the time also, that, yeah. well, objectivists are just sort of Fan, they're sort of fancy libertarians or yeah, something yeah. like they're libertarians that maybe have thought it through a little <laughs> bit more or some libertarians will say objectivists are libertarians who haven't thought about it enough. Yes, so, yes, yes. So it, what in, in your view would be the, the right well, amount? Well, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to position ourselves necessarily versus libertarians. I mean, I think we're more philosophical than libertarians, libertarians, and, but I also don't know what libertarianism means. I think that's the biggest problem. It's a big tent which includes anarcho-capitalists, some of them nice anarcho-capitalists, like Brian Kaplan, who was on this show, mm -hmm. some of them not very nice anarcho-capitalists, who are real, really bad guys, in my view, uh, and who do a lot of damage to the lib liberty movement, all the way to people who are kind of conservatives, who want a big role for government as compared to what I would want, mm -hmm. but it's still consider themselves Republican libertarian. So to me, the whole libertarian thing is, is kind of meaningless. Um, so I believe that government has only one role, and everything needs to be measured in that. And that is to protect the rights of individuals, to protect your right to life. That's the core, right? To protect the ability of individuals to pursue the rational values they need in order to live and to thrive and to be happy in the end of the day. So what does that entail? Well, protect them against what, right? Well, the criminals that are gonna steal your wallet, are gonna punch you in the face, are gonna murder you or rape you. There are always gonna be people like that, mm -hmm. right? So you need some protection entity, and that entity is government. It has the monopoly over the use of retaliatory force. They're there to protect you from the criminals. So when the ANCAP say even that could be privatized, that's somewhere where you say we've- Absolutely not. It yeah. cannot be privatized because that is legitimizing violence. That's saying violence, oh, we can have a market in violence. We can trade in violence. So it's a rejection of the idea that violence has no place in civilized humanity. They view it just as another market good. I view it as a different type of thing. Okay. And it's the anti-reason. So if you focus on the positive, which is reason, forces the anti-reason has to be excluded. But more than that, what the anarcho caps are saying is the truth, what is right about property rights, how we define property rights, truth is something to be negotiated between protection agencies. And objectivism says no, truth is something to be discovered by people responsible for discovering that truth. So what are the boundaries of certain types of property rights which are hard, right? Intellectual property rights, which a lot of anarcho-capitalists reject. Right. The role of government is to define those. It's, it's, to, it's to set boundaries of what they actually mean. And, and if you disagree with them, then that's what you have a court system and that's what you have a judiciary system. But, but at the end of the day, they have to be experts who define certain things about, so you need a legislature. And then so to define, but it's very narrow. It's to protect property rights, it's mm -hmm. to protect individual rights. And then you need a military to protect us from bad guys, invaders, terrorists, or whatever. But that's it. So, you know. It, well, but, what about roads and, po and postal service and things like so that? So, all the postal service. I mean, I mean, does anybody use the postal service anymore? <laughs> I mean, I, I, so you would I, be I, for privatizing I, that? I, I just oh, want to get some of this. All of that would be privatized. Yeah. Uh, suddenly, roads could be privatized. A whole book's written on how to do it. I'm not an expert in privatizing roads, and I think it's the last thing that we, that we, we need to deal with. But, it, but I don't think it's that hard, particularly with modern technology to privatize roads and to, and to charge a fee for usage on roads. These are easy things. I, you know, I think the challenging stuff that people talk about is healthcare and things like that, which I don't think is challenging because I think, I think the only reason it seems challenging to people is they lack imagination. But I, I ask Wait, audiences- so how, how would it be not challenging? I can't let you go <laughs> The solution that to healthcare is so easy, but, but you know, and I'll, I'll get to it, right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> So I ask audiences all the time, um, and I have to use my, well, you took my iPhone. We I took don't it. have an iPhone. We took oh it. I don't God. have my phone on me either. You took my iPhone. I can't yeah. use it as a prop. Yeah. Anyway, I ask audiences. We'll pretend you have an iPhone here. I think so here's the iPhone, right? Yes. yes. Would you want this designed by a government committee? 
what would it look like <laughs> if it was? And everybody freaks out, and of course, no, we don't, no, don't let it touch that, right? And I said, okay, what's more important? Healthcare or the iPhone? Well, healthcare is more important. Then why would you let an entity you would not design an iPhone? Why would you let them design healthcare system? Why would you let them dictate, you know, what doctors to see and what treatments to get? Why would you let a bunch of bureaucrats who can't design an iPhone, a simple product like an iPhone, deal with the human body, which is a million times more complex? Or with education, I use the same example for education. I don't want the government touching education because it's, it's too much for them. It's not what they're able to do. Why would you want the institution responsible for force using guns to come into a hospital? I don't want guns in hospitals. I don't want guns in schools, right? I'm mm -hmm. gonna get the Second Amendment guys after me. But I, I, don't want, right? I don't want the government in, I think when I see government, I see a gun. I see force, I see coercion, I see authority. The only place authority belongs is to protect from people with guns. That's it. I don't want that, that, that use of force anywhere else. So what is the solution? The solution is to privatize it. The solution is to bring the same kind of innovation, imagination, entrepreneurship into the healthcare space that we have in Silicon Valley. Right? Imagine if, 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 if doctors viewed themselves as entrepreneurs and if insurance companies could offer any product in the world that they, you would have, and, and economists have, have, you know, have, have come up with these, you would have insurance against pre-existing conditions. Mm -hmm. You could buy a product like that, it wouldn't be that hard. You would have all kinds of different insurance. I could, call, I could customize an insurance policy for me and I would, I would use the marketplace to figure out what treatments I wanted and didn't want and that prices would be clearly identifiable. So the solution to healthcare, the, the problems that we have today in healthcare, is more freedom. Just like that's the solution to any economic issue. It's, it's free up the entrepreneurial mind, free up the creators and the builders and the makers. So what, though, would you do about all of the people that just simply can't afford to get in the game? So using your iPhone analogy, obviously not everyone can afford an iPhone. There's gonna be a certain amount of people no matter what. Now I understand, before Obamacare, we took care of them at, at the emergency room yeah, and it was absurdly expensive. That's crazy. And now we have a, we have yeah, a different situation. Yeah, yeah. But, but, what, but are, you do you think the yourself, free market would somehow uh, no lift question, those people? But there's no question that they would. Look, one, the, so before Obamacare, 30 million Americans supposedly couldn't afford healthcare uh, to, buy, to buy health insurance. Um, and, the, and the question was why? And if you looked across states and you looked at the various insurance products, in states like California, which regulated to death exactly what an insurance company could offer, I have to pay for pregnancy and maternity and acupuncture. I've tried acupuncture, I don't like it, never gonna use it. <laughs> and a million other things that are covered. My insurance is incredibly expensive. But I, there are states, and I can't remember the exact which ones, but there are states that you could go to and get a simple policy that covered your emergencies and cost less than a cell phone bill. Now, how many Americans can't afford a cell phone? Almost none. Ninety-something percent of Americans have, 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 have cell phones and pay their bill on time and do, and do something like that. It, it, health insurance should be affordable to anybody. And it could be affordable to anybody if you got all these regulations and all these constraints. And then if you encourage competition with insurance companies, one of the problems is, we have two or three insurance companies that dominate the field. But that's because they can only sell a particular package. When you commoditize insurance, you get monopolization. What you need is to de get rid of the commodity aspect of it, let competition reign, let people come up with new innovations. And then you get real competition. And what does competition do everywhere, in every field? Drive prices down and drive quality up. And, that's, and if you did that, there would be nobody I'm not gonna say nobody would have no insurance. Somebody, would, some young person would say, hey, I don't need to buy insurance. I'm young and I'm indestructible. And you know what? And a certain sliver of people that simply still cannot afford it. A certain it. sliver couldn't afford it. So what do you do with those people? I mean, I would say, uh, I'd say the main thing you do with those people is you provide them with a the safety net, but that safety net should be provided privately and not a government. A government shouldn't decide who gets to be part of the safety net and who doesn't. We should decide. And again, I ask every audience, there's a video of me doing this at a, at a school. I say, how many of you want to take care, are willing to take a portion of your salary every month and pay into a fund that takes care of people who really cannot take care of themselves? Every hand in the room goes up. 
I said, so what's the problem? Why do we need a government bureaucrat to come with a gun and collect the money from you when you are happy to do it voluntarily and you all see why it's good for you and it's good for the world in which you want to live to help those people who have fallen in bad luck or who can't, for whatever reason, take care of themselves right now? So we, we create a private safety net. Now, I know, because I, I, we talked about this last time, and your listeners are very cynical. Oh, <laughs> nobody would pay in. So but that's so, But that's just not true. In the 19th century in America, there was no government safety net. And this country was relatively poor as compared to how rich we are today. And immigrants just flooded. The, you think the illegal immigrants from, from Mexico, some people think are a problem. The flood of immigrants that came into America in the 19th century far exceeds anything that has come in from Mexico as a per capita basis. Mm -hmm. They all found jobs, or some of them struggled, and family helped them, and others struggled, and the community helped them. But the government didn't intervene, and almost nobody, I'm not gonna say nobody died in the streets, but almost nobody died of starvation in the streets. Today, we're far richer. Mm -hmm. We have, you know, Patreon, we have mechanisms <laughs> to raise money that have never existed, you know, there's no question, in our, and we have these billionaires who have, uh, you know, the, the amount of money that they have, the amount of wealth that they have is unimaginable. The idea that in a culture like ours, we couldn't afford to take care of a few people who really can't take care of themselves is ludicrous to me. The idea that we need some government bureaucrat to decide how much of our income we'll have to donate to, is, is bizarre. We, I, I mean, it's maybe- part of that that we've just been sort of dumbed into yes. submission. We've just accepted yes. at this point that this is how it is. So if you were to say to the average person, well, would you give more? They'll say yes, but then to actually take the, the, the notion of I'm gonna now vote for people that are going to make that a reality is sort of a bridge too far. Like but it's more than that. It's that a lot of people will say this, and, and this, is, this is relates to a lot of issues. People will say, I would do it. I know I would do it, but, but they won't. But they, right. And I, I've talked to businessmen who say, I, my industry does not need to be regulated. We're honest, we do it right, there's competition. But that industry, they're all really bad people and they need to be regulated to and, and you see this projection, and this comes from a certain cynicism about the world, but it comes from a certain view of human nature, which again, I'm trying to combat. And I think this goes to the core of, I want people to adopt this idea that we can be rational, that we, we, we can think for ourselves, that m people can take care of themselves. 99.9% of, pe of humanity can take care of themselves, can feed themselves, can clothe themselves, can, can live a life that, that is, is successful. There are few people that for genetic reasons or whatever, are born incapacitated or accidents happen to them. But if you look at a human being out there, they can take care of themselves. And, I, and what they need is to, to be taught how. And they need to be educated. And they need to stop feeling sorry for themselves. And they need to get up on their feet. What a waste of a life to, 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 to moan and complain and bitch and, and assume that everybody's a bad guy around him. Embrace life. Do something positive. You know, make something of yourself at whatever yeah. level of ability you have. You yeah. know, some people have a low IQ or, 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 or have or not a strong or whatever. Whatever realm you live in, you can make something of your life. That's what that, that that's what I'm about. And if you if that's what you want in life, then the system that makes that possible is a system of freedom. Is a system that is not going to place artificial barriers in your pursuit of life. And as long as you're not hurting other people, you do what you do. And you know what? You're gonna fail sometimes. Failure is part of life. And when you fail, you can go to your neighbor and ask for help. And if you've been a nice guy, they will help you. And if you've been a rotten guy, they might not help you. That's part of, that's part of the personal responsibility question here, right? And you know, take responsibility for your own life, live it, don't expect other people uh, to be forced to help you. You don't have a right to pull a gun on your neighbor and, and demand their help. Somehow that gun goes away when we vote <laughs> to take money from our neighbors to help us. No, if, this is a, a, a great point, right? If something's immoral for an individual to do, it's immoral for the group to do. That's the point Ayn Rand make, right? So if stealing is wrong, then stealing is wrong. And it doesn't matter how many times we vote on it, it doesn't matter how many people vote on it, it's still stealing. It's still taking, using force, taking something away from me that belongs to me. So if we can just adopt that simple principle, right? And if we can, if we can understand and people can accept that personal responsibility, you know, that, that's the hope I have politically, uh, you know, in the, for the future.
Joran, I usually like to <laughs> offer a guest a chance to kind of sum up their philosophy and do it in a nice little bow. You beat me to it. I think, I think you beat me to it. I do want to add, though, before yeah, we end yeah. that, uh, as I said before, nec you know, next time maybe I have Shermer and Pragerin, we can get you involved in something like that for, that would be fun. for another perspective. That would be fun. But for the record, you have offered to debate plenty of people that I've had on the show. We're going to do, Ben Shapiro just said that he's willing to do something with you, so we're going to do that and see if we can mix this in because I think the next evolution of the ideas behind this show are having more of these conversations. Yeah, and, and, uh, and as people can discover on YouTube, I've debated plenty of people, yeah. so it's not, I don't, sh I don't shun the debating format, I enjoy it, uh, and, uh, and these are people I respect, so even though I disagree with many of them on, on many different issues, I believe in that dialogue. I believe the only way to actually move things forward is to discuss, to debate, and to, to use, as long as we all accept it, reason is the guide for truth, and that's where we're gonna discover truth out there, then, um, and yeah, I'm, bring them on. It's it's going to be a lot of fun. Are you going to do any of these events with me in the in the fall, or you're you're all over the world again? I'm all over the world again. I'm I'm traveling this fall. Uh, we'll, we'll 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 do some events on campus. We'll we'll make it happen. All right, very good. For more on your own, follow him on the Twitter machine at your own Brook.